I want to bring on another COVID challenger, Dr. Perry Helkidis, Dean of Rutgers School of Public Health and a research psychologist who has spent 25 years studying the health of LGBTQ people. Rutgers is supporting the New Jersey Health Department in setting up a statewide COVID-19 contact tracing program. Dr. Helkidis? Hi. How many contact tracers do we have and how many do we need? So at the end of the summer uh, 2020, we have about 1,500 to 2,000 contact tracers throughout the state of New Jersey who are deployed through the various counties and local health departments who do their work. Estimates suggest we need somewhere in the vicinity of 3,500 to 4,000 contact tracers to be able to do the work effectively um, given the second wave that we're expecting to happen over the course of the end of 2020. So what are the obstacles to getting more tracers? I think New Jerseyans have been extremely willing to become contact tracers, which has warmed my heart enormously. So the challenge at the beginning in terms of getting contact tracers was to educate the public about what it is. Fortunately, the New Jersey Department of Health did something really intelligent, which was partner with us at the Rutgers School of Public Health to bring in students as the first wave of contact tracers. So our students who were studying public health were aware of what contact tracing was and were willing to enroll, to be trained for 18 hours, and to become the first set of tracers that were deployed out into the state um, through all of the counties. If someone wants to become a contact tracer, what do they do? To become a contact tracer, the New Jersey Department of Health has a uh, really terrific contact tracing website that not only has information about the epidemiology of the disease and the symptoms of the disease and what you do if you're sick, but also what contact tracing is and how to become a contact tracer. And at that site, you can provide your information and then somebody from the state or their, their uh, agency that they're working with will be in touch with you about, about becoming a contact tracer. I've always said that contact tracing takes a nosy person, somebody who's curious, somebody who's willing to ask questions. So if you're willing to be persistent and ask questions and dig into people's life to find out who their contacts are, this might be a really terrific job for you. It's like being a detective. As a public health researcher, what surprised you about people's reactions to the COVID crisis? It's interesting for me to be living through this COVID pandemic because I was a young man growing up in New York City when the AIDS epidemic hit. And there was a lot of chaos and there was a lot of fear and there was a lot of anxiety and there was a lot of misinformation and there was a lot of stigma. And it's amazing to me and what surprised me the most was how similar the anxiety and the fear and the stigma felt again with COVID-19. And I thought we had evolved from that. I thought we had learned from the AIDS epidemic. But, you know, while we have learned some things, human beings continue to operate in ways that are not always rational. So not wearing masks, not believing that COVID-19 is real, all of these mythologies which perpetuated the disease, that's what surprised me and, quite frankly, upset me the most. How has the pandemic affected the LGBTQ population any differently than other populations? Yeah, the LGBTQ population, like uh, other marginalized populations in our country, whether we talk about people of color or we talk about women or we talk about immigrants, often experience more health disparities than the general population. And so for the last 25 years of my life, I've been studying the health of LGBTQ people and examining how social conditions and policies and laws affect their health. And I have every reason to believe, my hypothesis is as a scientist, that as a marginalized population, LGBTQ people are going to be subjected to infection at potentially higher rates and potential mortality at higher rates. I just finished undertaking a nation, nationwide survey um, on uh, COVID-19 um, experiences and disease and access to testing and obstacles to testing yeah, um, in LGBTQ people, over a thousand LGBTQ people, and we're just crunching the data right now. But I will tell you just preliminarily, um, many report symptoms and few were able to access a test. To me, that's an issue. To me, that's a health disparity. What about high risk behavior? Does that change at times like this? So, 
biological, psychological, and uh, behavioral and social phenomena all interact with each other. When we, people are stressed, when people experience stigma, they tend to engage in risk. We are seeing right now in the United States higher levels of intimate partner violence. We are going to see increases in alcohol, tobacco, and other drug use, all because of COVID. And there's a question as to the extent to which COVID-19 as a stressor is also perpetuating risk like sexual risk in populations. Um, it's interesting, right? Because this is like a dual-edged sword. Unlike HIV, which is very difficult to transmit, COVID-19 is very easy to transmit. So people are being conscious of the p possibility of transmitting the virus easily. So I don't know, I will tell you as soon as my analysis is over, the extent to which sexual risk has increased, but certainly mental health risk, certain alcohol risk, tobacco risk, and other drug risk are all higher than they were prior to the uh, pandemic. Thank you, Dr. Halkidis.